Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Sebastian Pöplau. I'm a student at Bonn University in Germany. And uh, first of all, I have to say thank you for inviting me to speak here. It's a great pleasure and honor to speak in front of you guys. And um, my topic is going to be USB honeypots. And uh, the project that I'm going to be talking about was conducted at uh, the University of Bonn's Institute of Computer Science 4. So thank you to those guys. Um, sorry? All right. Let me first show, the, show you the agenda. So I'm first going to talk about the concept itself and how we implement it is. And afterwards we'll see a live demo, which hopefully will work, you never know. And um, yeah, talk about the evaluation of the concept that we did. So first of all, what is all this about? You know, the, the more traditional way of malware to spread from machine to machine is to somehow use the network. The, the first approach was to just attack vulnerable services that another machine might offer on the network. So when we tried to develop a honeypot for such malware, we would write software that emulates vulnerable network services. Honeytrap or Dionia are examples of such honeypots. And, um, you know, then exploitation proceeded to rather target clients than uh, network services. So what the malware would do, like uh, Angelo pointed out, is attacking client software like web browsers or PDF readers or whatever. So our, honey, our honeypots have to adapt to that. And um, we would write honeypots that emulate such clients. Now imagine that malware tries for purpose of espionage or sabotage or whatever malware authors would like to achieve, tries to reach a certain machine that is not connected to any network for security reasons. Then you need other means to reach that machine, being a malware author, which hopefully you aren't, but you know. And um, one popular method which has become popular is using USB flash drives. Because if you have a machine that does not have access to any network at all, then still the employees working with that machine need to transfer data between other machines and this one. So what you would use is such a small USB flash drive you connect it to your machine and, and to the secret machine, and malware uses exactly that device to get to that machine. You know, this has been shown impressively by Stuxnet, which uh, used USB flash drives to infect high security machines, which probably were not connected to a network, but still the authors were able to infect those machines using USB flash drives. So it is interesting for us to also concentrate on this propagation means with our honeypots. Because most honeypots that exist now usually target network-based propagation. We emulate network services and uh, we emulate network clients to, to catch malware, but we usually don't look at USB flash drives. So what I'm going to present today is a concept or a system that targets such USB malware. Malware that copies itself to removable devices, especially USB flash drives, in order to spread from one machine to another one. So if we do so, we have to slightly shift our usage paradigm of such honeypots. Because if you concentrate on network traffic and, and malware that spreads across networks, you can basically just connect your honeypot machine to the network that you would like to monitor. And if you connect it to the right switch or hub, then you are able to capture all the traffic that goes along the network. There is no need to, to deploy something to productive machines. You can have dedicated honeypot machines. However, with USB flash drives, this is not quite as simple because um, if you have a dedicated machine that a honeypot runs on, 
you would need a policy that every employee in your organization first connect the USB flash drive to the dedicated machine before actually using it on a productive machine. And that's quite inconvenient and maybe not practicable. So the idea is to develop a honeypot that is efficient enough to be deployed on productive systems because that is usually where USB flash drives are used. So if we want to capture malware on such devices, we deploy our honeypot directly to those productive machines. Meaning also that we have to cope with the systems that are used there, which most of the times will be Microsoft Windows systems. So the implementation of the concept that I'm going to show you is um, written for Microsoft Windows. Now let's first think about how we can capture malware on such USB devices. And for that, we look at the typical infection scenario. So here we have two machines, one of which is infected by some USB malware. And now we plug a flash drive into that machine. As soon as we do so, the malware will copy itself to the flash drive without us noticing that. And then we carry the device to some other machine which is supposed to be secure because it is not connected to any network, plug it in and the malware will exploit some, some application or do social engineering or whatever and will infect the machine. So during this propagation process we somewhere have to find um, like a point to, to interfere. We would like to capture the malware while it travels from one machine to another one and we need to find a place where we can do so. So let's look again at the process, keeping that in mind. Again, we have the infected machine and the clean one. We attach a clean USB flash drive to the machine and we notice that immediately the flash drive is infected. And that's the key point of this honeypot I'm suggesting today because we know without having any knowledge about the, the actual malware on that machine that if we plug in a USB flash drive and wait for a sufficient time, the malware will eventually copy itself to the flash drive. So the idea of the honeypot, the basic idea, is to have a USB flash drive plugged into machines in order to test whether those machines are infected with USB malware. Of course, it is not feasible to have someone walk around your company and plug in a USB stick to each machine. So we do a solution in software. We emulate a USB flash drive so that for any application it looks as if a flash drive had been attached. And basically the implementation is just based on an image file. So each um, request, IO request to that device is serviced to or from an image file. That way we can capture malware that might be written to our device and just copy it or write it to the image file for later analysis. So this is our key point here. Then for the sake of completeness, let's continue the example. We plug the device into the other machine which is infected and here the second point to interfere would be we could do some kind of analysis on machines where USB flash drives are plugged in to see whether an infection is started from those devices. However, that's more complicated, I think, and we would need some clever heuristics in order to classify what's going on from such devices. So we're concentrating on the first approach that I showed you. And um, the honeypot that I'm talking about basically consists of two components, of which only the first one is the really interesting stuff, the other one is more a complementary part. And the first one is what I just told you, it's um, a software that emulates a virtual USB flash drive in order to see whether a machine is infected with USB malware. The second one would target the second um, point of interception that I just showed you, but it's less interesting, I would say. So let's now talk about how we can actually 
achieve the emulation of a USB flash drive in such a way that for malware it looks as if the flash drive were real. It turns out that um, there are many solutions that somehow emulate storage devices on Windows. For example, Daemon Tools emulates CD and DVD drives. And there are others who emulate hard disks. But the key concept that they do not fulfill is removability. Because um, for malware, there are different APIs to detect when a new device is attached to the computer. And um, quite a common one is to use window messages. Windows sends out a message to all open windows whenever a new device is attached. And software that receives the message can detect within the message whether the new device is re removable or not. So the concept of removability plays a very important role here because usually the infection process is only triggered if the new device is classified removable by the operating system. So now of course we could hook that particular function and always tell the malware that some new device is removable but we don't know about different APIs. There are different ways and we might not get them all hooked. So we decided to use a different approach and that is um, implement some kernel driver that emulates the device and flags it as removable. Before we can talk about that in more detail, we have to talk about device enumeration because obviously a removable device is not loaded all the time that the system is running. So we don't want the driver of that device to be loaded when we start the system and to be unloaded when we shut down, but rather we would like to load it on demand. We would like to, to issue some command which leads to the virtual device being mounted. So how are drivers loaded in the Windows kernel? We have some, some basic drivers, usually bus drivers, which are loaded all the time. That's not what we want, but there are such bus drivers. And um, let's say the USB bus driver is one of them. Whenever you plug in a new USB device, the driver will report that new device to the operating system, which then loads an appropriate driver. So here we get another driver on top of that. And that driver, again, may report new devices. For example, if you attach a storage device to your USB bus, then first a driver for storage devices will be loaded. And that driver analyzes the storage device, detects multiple partitions, and reports each partition again as a new device, for which then the file system driver is loaded. So this driver may report new devices, and so on. And we get a stack-like structure of uh, drivers which are loaded in the operating system. Obviously, such a chain of, of drivers has to start somewhere, right? We, we have to have drivers which are loaded all the time. And those are called root enumerated drivers. Basically, that means that um, we tell the operating system to always assume that a certain device is present. The PCI bus is an example for such a device. Whenever you boot up your system, it assumes that a PCI bus is present and loads the appropriate driver. That driver then, again, detects devices which are attached to the PCI bus and further drivers are loaded on demand. But there are those root enumerated drivers which are loaded right from the start on. How do we use those concepts for our virtual removable device? Well, basically, on the left-hand side here, you can see the typical driver stack for a USB flash drive. It might not be complete, but doesn't matter to us here. On the basic levels, you see the USB drivers. And then here we have drivers which are involved in, in storage management and disk management. And on top, we have the file system driver. It turns out that the notion of removability is established at the disk class drivers level. So this is the driver that inspects a new device and finds out whether that device is a removable device or not. So what we would like to do is we replace that driver in order to have 
a system that will always tell the operating system, I have a removable device. So this driver, Ghost Drive, is basically the virtual device that we want to have. It um, writes all data that is written to the virtual device to some image file, and if it gets read requests for the virtual device, it services them from the image file. But as I said before, we don't want that driver to be loaded all the time. So there's a second driver, Ghost Bus. So the name of the whole thing is Ghost, which is why they all are named Ghost something. Um, Ghost Bus is a root enumerated driver. So that one is loaded at system startup and um, it is responsible for some virtual bus system. So some system that is not really there, but it is able to enumerate new devices. And now whenever we would like to plug in the virtual USB flash drive, we tell this driver to report a new device to the operating system. And the operating system will subsequently load the appropriate driver, which is this one. So we are able to mount the virtual USB flash drive on demand, which is what we wanted to establish the notion of a removable device to applications. All right. Now the most exciting part comes, the live demo. Let's hope that it works. I have a virtual machine running Windows XP Service Pack 2, if I can get it on the right screen. There we go. The operating system is in German, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. But still, it doesn't, doesn't change things. Um, oh, there we are. So for demonstration purposes, I infected the machine with Configure. And um, we're going to see how the whole Honeypot system works here. So first you observe that there are no removable devices. We only have the local hard disk, a CD drive and some network share. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell the virtual bus driver to mount the USB flash drive to report a new device to the operating system that will be classified as removable. So let's do that. At the moment this is done in a command line tool, but of course more sophisticated ways could be thought of. All right, sorry, finished. That's good. Now the virtual device has been mounted and as you can see in Windows Explorer, we now have a new device. That's a removable device, which is reported and we could now copy files to it. Ob obviously we don't want to do that. We want to let the malware copy data to it. Also, you can see that in the safe removal tool down here, our device, Ghost Drive, is being reported as a removable device. So for the higher layers of the operating system, this is completely, completely appears as a removable device. And any API that the malware might use in, in user space or on the higher levels of the operating system kernel will always tell it that the device is really a removable one and not a virtual one or a, a hard disk or whatever. So meanwhile, Configure has also detected the new device. Actually, it detects it in less than a second and has infected the device. We will not be able to see the files because of the rootkit that Configure installs on infected machines. So we can't see anything here. But I'm going to copy the image file that the virtual device is uh, serviced from to my local machine here. And then I'm going to show you that it is really infected. So first now I'm going to unmount the virtual device and when I do so, the driver will tell me that there have been write requests to the device, which is a hint that 
the machine is infected with some kind of USB malware. All right, here we have the warning. There were write requests to the device, and this is a sign that the machine might be infected. Of course, we have to make sure that while the virtual device is mounted, the user does not copy data to that device, so it must be hidden from the user. We'll talk about possible concepts for that later, but first we have to examine the actual image file. Um, let me copy it to my local machine. Here we have the file, it's just a binary image, and I'm going to copy that to the local machine, right? There we are. I can mount the image on my Mac, and if I then open it, you can see those two files, auto run inf and recycler, which is the configure infection. So it has worked in this case. No, it, it usually works. <laughs> Actually, it's that's always the problem with demos. You try them a hundred times, they always work, and then they fail you in the actual presentation. But this time, apparently, it worked. So this is the configure binary. So we are provided with the binary of, of the malware and can now use that for further analysis. So we don't have to extract it from some network traffic or extract it from the file system, but we are immediately provided with all data that the malware needs to infect a PC, which is quite a, an advantage. So then let's continue with the slides. Right. We did an evaluation of the thing, not only using Configure, but using those eight different samples. And um, the key feature that they had to fulfill in order to be selected for the evaluation were to infect physical USB flash drives. That's the only thing our honeypot needs in order to detect malware. The malware has to infect removable devices. So we picked those eight. You can see different name classifications from antivirus companies here. And um, in particular, we included Configure because it's quite a high level malware and still it is fooled by the virtual USB flash drive. As Angelo mentioned before, malware is, is um, increasingly getting cleverer in, in trying to avoid honeypots. So it's quite, quite a good thing to see that in terms of USB device detection, they are not as clever yet. So even Configure is not able to detect that the device it is infecting in reality is not a physical USB flash drive, but just a virtual one. We measured the time that it takes for each malware to infect the device. So the time from mounting the virtual device until the device is infected and, and we are provided with the full malware binaries. And it turns out that eight seconds on average are enough to get an infection reliably. For Configure, as you can see here, it is even less. In, in about one second after mounting, Configure has completed the infection of uh, the virtual device. And as I said during the demo, we have to avoid that the user copies data <coughs> to the virtual device. But if you see here that it only takes a few seconds for the malware to infect that virtual device, this is not a real problem. So we should be able to find some eight seconds where the user does not copy data to a device. One idea would be to only mount the virtual device when the screensaver is active or when the screen is locked you would some find some, some possibilities to hide everything from the users. An interesting side note that we 
found during the evaluations is that most of those malware samples didn't use technical exploits to infect the target machine, but rather social engineering. Like Configure did, they just show maybe additional uh, points in the, in the open, this, this menu that pops up when you plug a new device. So Configure showed a folder icon and said open files with Explorer, and you would click that. But that's just a side remark. So concluding, we can say that the concept is very successful with current malware. Of course, it's always like a, a cat and mouse game. As soon as the honeypot is deployed on a, on a larger scale, people will try to adapt to it and try to detect it. But since the honeypot is, is rooted deeply within the operating system kernel, it takes sufficiently more effort to detect the honeypot than malware is undertaking now to find removable devices. Also, the system is uh, suited excellently for host-based intrusion detection, because if you deploy it on each machine in your company, then you will easily find out when you're infected with some USB malware. And as we saw before, we do not require any knowledge about the malware, except that it does spread across USB flash drives. Now, before I finish, I'd like to talk about some things that we might to do to improve what we have now. The first thing I already mentioned, we have to hide the whole process from the user to avoid that they copy data to the device. Also, it might be that some other application copies data to newly attached USB flash drives without being malware, but so far we didn't observe any application that does so. For example, if you plug in a USB flash drive to your Mac, then it will write some index files onto the device, and um, Windows does not. So this should not be a problem in most of the cases. Another desirable improvement on the system would be to analyze the files that have been written to the virtual device on the Honeypot machine directly. Because at the moment, we only have the image file, and as I showed you, we are not able to see the files that have been written to the image because of the rootkit that the malware installs. So in order to analyze the image on that machine anyway, we would have to write some kind of user space file system driver. That might be a future improvement on the system. The next logical step in using it would be to try and deploy it to some real organization because all the evaluation work that we did were conducted in kind of a controlled environment. environment you know. We had some machines that we, we controlled and, and we knew how everything worked there and it would be interesting to deploy the system in a real organization to find out whether there actually is malware that only spreads across USB flash drives that we do not catch in our usual network honeypots. So if you happen to know such an organization, please tell me. And with that, I have to say thank you for your attention and I'm open to questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's true. Okay, maybe maybe they can also use uh, file infected stuff. Like, like yeah, you might want to. You would have to define to somehow define what is malicious and what is user data. You know, I mean the the auto run in file that malware might copy there, might just yeah, it could be does not look like like malicious or might be there if the user copies data there. So I think it's good in general if you can hide it from the user. Yeah, don't you think so? No. I haven't implemented it yet, so we can still change that. Sebastian, we don't have any more time for questions. 
All right. Sorry. <laughs>